Um, <clears throat> we will continue with uh, the chapter of uh, cardiology uh, in lifestyle medicine. So actually, I never imagined that so fast we could uh, we could talk about um, about cardiology and lifestyle medicine. But in the um, in the European certificate in the last session, I don't know what happened, but we had many many cardiologists. And then I said okay, and was also. Um, a group of, uh, of participants who are really uh, pushing, but let's do something, let's organize, let's, uh, let's build something. So then I had the chance with uh, Professor Dr. Carlos van Migem from, uh, from Belgium, a cardiologist, who took this heavy responsibility to coordinate uh, a group of uh, participants, cardiologists who participated in um, uh, in the certificate, but also with uh, ELMO experts. Uh, and also um, um, lifestyle medicine passionate uh, cardiologist. So uh, please, uh, Carlos, uh, you have the microphone. Okay, thank you, Johan. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes, we're here. Okay. So good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you very much, uh, Johan, for um, having me in this uh, important course. And I'm glad to uh, share this session together with um, three other high-level cardiologists who are with me today, and that is uh, Robert Kelly from Ireland, Stefan Busunatu from Romania, and then we have Elisa Veta from Moscow. I don't see her yet being locked in. So, um, without further ado, let me first uh, give the floor to uh, the other participants to introduce themselves before I proceed with uh, the first presentation. So maybe, uh, uh, Robert, I give the floor to you. Um, thank you, Carlos. Uh, so I'm uh, Robert Kelly. Uh, I'm a cardiologist in Ireland. Uh, I am one of those passionate people about lifestyle medicine and I've been a huge advocate of it in Ireland. Um, and I'm also one of the ambassadors for ELMO for Ireland, along with uh, David uh, Susta, who spoke earlier on this morning. So I look forward very much to the session. Uh, Carlos will tell you what I'm talking about a little bit later. Okay. Stefan, welcome in the, in the course. Uh, I'll give the floor to you. Hello, hello to you all. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm Stefan Busnato. I'm a cardiologist in Bucharest. Uh, Romania. Uh, the focus of my interests are related to uh, interventional cardiology and cardiac rehabilitation and uh, everything that is related to secondary prevention of cardiovascular diseases. I'm also the uh, Romanian Young Ambassador on behalf of the European Association of Preventive Cardiology and uh, eventually I hope that I'll be more uh, collaborating with the Lifestyle Medicine Organization for the Future on behalf of the University of Medicine and Pharmacy. And I'll speak more about me also during the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I see that Elisaveta is, uh, has been locked uh, in as well. Elisaveta, you have the, the floor. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Elisaveta Kuznetsova. I'm cardiologist and general practitioner from Moscow and a lot of years I worked in intensive care unit and in cardio unit for patients with myocardial infarct infarction and different uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, and now my focus of interest is uh, cardio rehabilitation and I will talk about my uh, experience and about lifestyle medicine too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm trying to open up uh, my presentation. I'm trying to share the screen. Theoretically should work. It's not there yet, I think, uh, Johan. No, 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 not yet. Uh, it's, on, it's not working on the share screen. So it seems that just Yanis had really good luck with, I mean, chance with the administrative part this morning. <laughs> Um, 
if not, you can send me the or so or someone else he has the, the copy just can open it. So yeah, maybe um, uh, Robert, uh, maybe you could open up the uh, presentation for me or Stefan because uh, you all have the uh, the presentation. Okay, so thank you, Robert. Um, we can go to the next slide. Let me do it and put it on full screen. Okay, Stefan. So we could go to slide. Uh, yeah, so we have, okay, next slide. Next one, okay. Um, so I will. Uh, talk shortly about uh, the basics and how to uh, connect lifestyle medicine with cardiology. And as, as you see here in this slide, um, in 1990, the two main important causes of death worldwide were ischemic heart disease and cerebrovascular disease. And uh, in 1997, it was predicted that both of those diseases would remain the main causes uh, in 2020. Next slide. And indeed, when you look at these most recent statistics, uh, ischemic heart disease and cerebrovascular disease remained the main cause of death in the Western world. And one of the reasons is that we face an epidemic in diabetes, obesity. Next slide, please. This is an important case control study, InterHeart, and uh, they looked at almost 30,000 people who suffered from an acute myocardial infarction in 52 countries. And they showed that in nine out of 10 people who suffer from acute myocardial infarction, you can find modifiable risk factors. Next one, Stefan. So, okay. This is an important slide. So this is a uh, summary of 10 population studies and they looked at the advances in cardiology the last 50 years. And what you see on average is that the main uh, advance, uh, the main uh, improvement in healthcare comes from control of risk factors. Just one, uh, okay. And importantly, uh, what we define as healthcare today is only a fraction of what determines our health. The health behaviors and the environments are much more uh, important and contribute much more to our health compared to what we derive from classical healthcare. Next slide, please. This is an important concept. So we have uh, two ideas, life expectancy, that means how many years we live on average, which in Europe is between 80 and 85 uh, years. And the other concept is the amount of life years we live uh, in good uh, health, so without disabilities. And that on average in Europe is 62 to 64 years. So the difference between those two is the years with disability. And those years with disability, we uh, uh, have to take drugs, we uh, need to see uh, our general practitioners, general practitioners on a regular basis, we need to see, we need to see specialists. Just one, uh, okay, one more, Stefan. And the uh, uh, importance of lifestyle medicine is that we uh, will be able to bring up the lower level, so the number of years lived in good health, uh, more to our point of death. Less important is to increase uh, our uh, uh, number of uh, years we live in totally. So we are moving from uh, important issues in the past, uh, religion, patriotism, tradition, to what uh, is very important today when we do uh, polls in the general public is the uh, importance of having a good uh, health in general. So lifestyle medicine, I think, will move to become the new religion in our uh, current day society. Next slide, please. 
Mickey Mantle, uh, he was a very famous uh, American baseball player. He died of uh, alcoholic liver disease uh, after a long uh, disease pen infect. And he has been quoted to say that if I, had if I had known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. And the idea is to die young as late as possible. So this slide summarizes the uh, basic uh, components of lifestyle medicine, the basic pillars. And in order to be able to open the slot, we have to um, uh, pay attention to all the different components to uh, maximize our um, uh, uh, health. So that has been my presentation. Um, so I suggest that uh, we go over our talks first and I will take note of the, the questions that come in and then uh, at the end we can have a, a panel discussion. So maybe now um, I open up the floor to, um, in the program it was foreseen, Elisaveta. So maybe Elisaveta, you can give us your presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, for your presentation. Jon, thank you for organizing this Congress. Uh, so, um, I would say that in mindfulness is one of the practices calling turning towards difficult. And my opinion is that uh, conventional cardiology is turning to the lifestyle medicine. Uh, as uh, we discussed today, um, and as you said, Carlos, uh, about um, lifestyle medicine chapters, I think that all lifestyle medicine chapters correlates with cardiovascular diseases. According to last guidelines, uh, we can see that they become more uh, closer to uh, lifestyle medicine. Of course, uh, in all guidelines, it is written about physical activity, for example. But in last guidelines, we really know more for which patients, which type of activity is good. And um, it is really evidence-based recommendations, a very good one. Uh, about nutrition and about uh, diet, uh, which we should follow to, if we have hypertension or dyslipidemias. Also, it is really good guidelines and they help us to recommend our patients proper food but it is not enough for them and for us we know we need to know more about nutrition as for behavior change i just want to cite uh, um, greco he um, uh, have a talk according to uh, European Society of Preventive, uh, Preventive Cardiology and he talked about motivation interviewing for our patients and uh, there was a small discussion about it and um, somebody asked him who should do this motivation interviewing and he said that maybe psychologists can do that um, for example well I think that cardiologists also can do that uh, as for addictions, well, I think not only cardiovascular guidelines talks about addictions, uh, smoking cessation, alcohol consumption, but also I think that we need to work more with our patient in this chapter because it's not easy for our patients to stop smoking, for example. And as for community, um, we have uh, schools for pregnant women, for patients with hypertension, patients with diabetes, but we don't have really schools with, for patients with ischemic heart disease, for example. And I think that community support is very important. I want to give you an example. Uh, this project, uh, my son really loves this slide because he is a fan of football. Uh, so, uh, this project started around 10 years ago and um, it took around 10 weeks um, of training people who are fans of these Glasgow football uh, clubs 
and they really um, had um, football trainings with football coach, fitness coach, and nutritional expert. And the uh, attendance for these 10 weeks was 100%. Um, and they have really good results. They lose weight and they um, um, eat healthier and uh, am uh, amount of uh, total cholesterol becomes lower during this first period, 10 weeks, and also blood pressure become lower. Um, but the most uh, impressive result is that uh, they have one more checkup in 15 months. And most of these guys continue their healthy lifestyle habits. And that's why, for example, we can see that total cholesterol reduces during these 15 months significantly. I think it is great results for this project and it shows how much, how important the environment and community support is and that it, it could help to cope with a lot of problems. As for my experience, I would uh, talk about a few clinical cases. One is a really typical patient with ischemic heart disease, uh, and he's, he had a lot of uh, lifestyle related risk factors smoking, obesity, elevated blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, and he um, attended to our intensive care unit um, due to first uh, episode of unstable angina, and he got stent stenting and uh, all recommendations so include the therapy and also i talked with him at discharge about smoking cessation nutrition and physical activity a lot but he decided not to do all this and in seven days he returned back with uh, stent thrombosis and again he got pci and stenting and all um, therapy that he needed and we talk again about his lifestyle. So this man was really afraid of this situation. And then he came to me for checkup in one and a half months or in two months. And I really did not recognize him because he looked younger. He looked like he was uh, 45 and he changed his life. Uh, he stopped smoking, he followed proper diet. He drank all medication and he started drawing maps uh, um, with thousands of steps he performed every day. As a result, he lost 10 kilos and uh, within six months we reduced dose of antihypertensive therapy. Of course, fear is not the best motivation, but for this case it was successful. Another clinical case is about a um, lady. Um, she had a cabbage and PCR with stenting and she received a lot of medication due to her high blood pressure. She followed healthy diet and no uh, addictions and he ha she has good physical activity. So what else? She came from, uh, for checkup um, after one month in Montenegro. Uh, she looked great, uh, but she has small, uh, she has emotional lability probably due to her, her low LDL level because it was less than one millimeter per liter. So what changed? She swam every day, she climbed to this mountain every day, she ate fish every day. And this, all this was enough to change her blood pressure and LDL level. So as I know that she decided to go back uh, for holidays there for two months more and uh, we uh, uh, reduced statin level and lowering antihypertensive therapy. But, well, I will say more that she um, did not drink statins uh, next two months. And when she came to check up in two months, uh, her LDL level was 1.5. So all this was enough for her good feeling and even without statins, she got a good LDL level. Um, of course, for the healthy habits, we need time. And it differs uh, from person to person. For, for one person, one and a half months is enough. And for another one, is uh, six months is good period. 
And according to different studies uh, for behavior changes and for new habits formation, it uh, lasts from 10 to 53 weeks. Uh, but for example, patients after myocardial infarction should be followed by cardiologists um, during first year after MI. And I think that we can uh, combine cardio checkup with lifestyle medicine intervention for new habits formation. Because I think that all cardiology patients need lifestyle medicine to help them to cope with these problems. Um, so, of course, we have guidelines that help us to cope with many things, with physical activity, nutrition, but also we have a lot of work to do and uh, with behavior changes, with sleep, for, uh, with uh, sexuality, because of course all of us know that erectile dysfunction correlates to cardiovascular disease, but we don't have a lot of specialists on them. Also stress management, it's related to cardiovascular disease, but uh, not uh, a lot of cardiologists are working with stress. And as I told about community, I think it's really important thing because it could help to cope with all, um, in most, mostly could help to cope with all lifestyle chapters for these patients. And one more thing is important that our patients, especially with cardiovascular disease, they very often have anxiety or depression. And sometimes they are really not ready to talk about something else except uh, their disease. Sometimes they are not ready even to talk about related to these uh, disease factors. And for them, it's important to talk uh, with open-ended questions, with motivation interviewing, and all this that lifestyle medicine interviewing teach us to do and help us to do. So I think it's important for this uh, patients. So what is good for them? I think that a good um, decision could be cardiovascular rehabilitations with regular check uh, up with lifestyle medical consultation for a long period for new healthy habits formation. And of course we need multi-team working groups because for one patient is important nutrition and for another one uh, stress management is another important tool and for third one he just needs to sleep better so i think uh, that it will be work uh, in these uh, multi-team working groups and also as i mentioned previously that patient school are very important for them and for this reason i think that all doors are open for us thank you thank you Elisaveta for this uh, nice presentation. So I would uh, suggest to go on with the, the presentation of Stefan, who will uh, talk about the, uh, the uh, importance of using new technologies, e-health in uh, cardiology. Okay. Stefan, the, the floor is yours. Elisaveta, if you can please. I, I uh, try close. to stop my sharing one second. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, I hope you all see my screen. I'll have, a, let's say, a more extensive presentation related to innovation, related to cardiology, and related to the way that I think that uh, taking into consideration our national context, because I speak about Romania, uh, and uh, when thinking about what uh, Romania provides in terms of uh, uh, preventive uh, cardiology, but not only cardiology, the prevention of all non-communicable diseases, uh, we need to adapt a lot because we don't have support. We don't have governmental support, political support, as Ioannis was mentioning uh, previously, that this is a real need, but we don't have it. So um, basically, uh, I'd like to uh, say that most of the day I do cardiology. I do cardiac rehabilitation, I do interventional cardiology, and uh, I also do uh, research activities towards 
eHealth and eCardiology solutions. A part of that, I also do administrative functions, like I'm the vice dean of the Faculty of Medicine on students' problems, and uh, I'm also in the Ministry of Health in terms of the building the eHealth strategy of Romania for 2021-2027. And also, I'm a biker, because I think this is the most important thing when we speak about lifestyle medicine and the way a doctor should teach, treat, educate patients. Now, when coming back to the actual context, like uh, Carlos was mentioning before, we know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death globally. It's related to nine most important risk factors that unfortunately are, are rising at the moment. I have posted here an image related to the heart failure situation around the, uh, around the globe, which is threatening, which we say we have a pandemia related to SARS-CoV-2 infections, but we also have a pandemia related to cardiovascular diseases. The situation with the coronavirus, like throughout Europe, it's evolving badly because we, uh, we have like uh, uh, 10,000 new cases each day with 200 deaths. Uh, each day and the system is overwhelmed because as everyone uh, uh, has the problem we don't have enough medical doctors we don't have time and uh, on top of that we we have to take into account that in Romania the cardiovascular mortality rate is two times higher than the one in the other European countries and this is closely related to the fact that we don't have governmental support for the prevention and rehabilitation programs for uh, cardiac patients. And uh, that's why starting like from 2015, I had to readjust when I become involved in the Europe European Association of Preventive Cardiology and Europe European Association of Cardiology uh, by learning from the other countries I had to readjust in order to find a way to help the patients and help the community in relationship to the cardiovascular diseases. So I developed uh, different systems, uh, uh, different solutions in order to facilitate clear communication about the reality and the methods to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in people on risk, developed campaigns on awareness related to heart health, and uh, how to drive healthy behavior throughout the year. I try to inspire more and more people and patients related to, uh, to a healthy lifestyle and also to adapt and use innovation to develop technology-friendly apps and telemedicine. This by education and also using innovation. In terms of the clear communication, uh, I say that uh, facing this situation with COVID-19, we, we did a lot of uh, activities that were coordinated by me inside the University of Medicine and Pharmacy, Carol Davila from, uh, from Bucharest, and we initiated the national campaign on prevention of, uh, and uh, on healthy habits to be performed by, uh, by the patients and by the citizens. Uh, because we need to take care of our hearts as it's one of the most important aspects of our lives. In terms of the uh, development of campaigns and raising awareness related to heart health, I also initiated uh, uh, local campaigns that weren't related to the so, uh, Romanian Society of Cardiology or other Society of Cardiology because I have this feeling and I think that you all have this feeling that it's the duty of every medical professional, everyone that needs to promote lifestyle medicine needs to do these things because we don't have enough time to uh, facilitate the discussion, the education that the patient would need when we meet the patient in face to face. So basically this is why I started two major platforms, one that is dedicated, well, it's basically my presentation page and it's a blog that uh, facilitates the inspiration actions related to uh, more the thinking that although you have, you are doing a lot of things around the day, you still have time to do sport, you still have time to, to have a, a healthy lifestyle and also I tried a lot and I think that I managed uh, to do this thing uh, uh, in a good manner to build a place where uh, patients, my patients and uh, the other patients that are interested in cardiovascular diseases and the education around cardiovascular diseases can find a place to 
to from where to learn important essential information. This uh, the first one was the platform that I've developed for me, and the second one was a platform that I've developed for cardiac rehabilitation in Romania. It's a national platform that basically drags all the uh, cardiac rehabilitation centers from Romania. It promotes this action because, unfortunately, uh, in Romania, we don't have cardiac rehabilitation reimbursed, but, and we don't have it even stated in the, uh, the health law as, as a possible service for the patient. And this is a big problem that we hope that it will be you know, corrected in the, the maybe in the next year. Uh, and uh, coming back to the point that um, it's somehow the focus of my talk, it's uh, the other aspect that, uh, that I do uh, in order to adapt to the current situation and to use innovation to develop technology-friendly apps using telemedicine and uh, new e-health solutions. Uh, and here you have pictures from the cardiac rehabilitation laboratory that uh, uh, I'm coordinating in the Bagdazar Arseni Hospital from Bucharest. Uh, we basically do here ambulatory cardiac rehabilitation. And uh, starting 2018, we started the Horizon 2020 project, where basically you know, the, the name of the project is VCARE, uh, Virtual Coaching for uh, Active uh, uh, living for elderly patients and um, we have a, a news case that is focused on uh, creating a virtual coach that could uh, assist the patient at home uh, the patient with heart failure to perform his uh, uh, cardiac rehabilitation but it's not also related to cardiac rehabilitation it is much more related to a virtual assistant that would be uh, monitoring and counseling the patient throughout his life because it's somehow as a, in a long life uh, assistant of the patient. The idea, the general idea of, uh, of the project in which the university is a clinical partner um, and the, the consortia is formed from partners throughout Europe is to validate the solution in order to bring patient empowerment. Uh, basically, there are solutions that are available on the market like telemonitoring using the sensor that probably you all know blood pressure monitoring, weight monitoring, uh, heart rate monitoring, and quality of sleep monitoring and stress monitoring, uh, together with uh, a system uh, of gamification using uh, the TV and body movement sensors, uh, together with the implementation of the uh, contextualization of the environment of the patient when speaking about the location of the patient when speaking about the weather, the possible fluctuations of the weather or the outside temperature and other conditions like events. Also, um, uh, we aim to embed into the system's functions like uh, uh, facial expression detections and mood detection, uh, basically trying to compress a huge amount of data that will be processed using machine learning and would transform this, this system in an automatically adaptable system because it's, uh, it's aimed to start uh, in a, a semi-automatic mode by integrating the cardiac rehabilitation team, you know, which I don't know if you all know, basically a cardiac rehabilitation team is normally comprised of a cardiologist, of a nutritionist, of, of a, a psychologist, of a kinetotherapist and a nurse. And uh, from starting on the traditional uh, rehabilitation pathway, we try by this machine learning process to empower the system to make it intelligent using AI and machine learning to be uh, capable of self-adaptation in, in order to ensure the, that the patient can have an interaction and can have a, a, not a static rule-based interaction, but a dynamic interaction, somehow uh, like communicating with, um, with a medical professional. At the moment, we are in the step where we, are, uh, we have tested these individual components that I have mentioned to you, the telemonitoring, the gamification, the uh, uh, facial recognition and the uh, uh, expression and communication with the patients and uh, starting uh, January 
we will start into the clinic and test the entire system with the patient. We are facing at the moment these difficulties that everyone faces with the limited number of patients and this spread related to the COVID possible infections. And this uh, somehow uh, derails a little bit the, the action plan. But taking into consideration what we are living at the moment basically and how medicine is shaping around this digitalization at the moment, I think that this uh, project that we have together with the other 14, because it's a PM15 call, Horizon 2020 call, that are centered around other use cases related to uh, uh, healthy uh, uh, aging uh, people or diseased people with different disabilities, with non-communicable diseases, that are trying to build these virtual coaches, will be probably the future, will be the way that the lifestyle medicine will be as a new religion, the, how it was uh, said by Carlos, it will be transformed in a new religion by using this technology. Uh, and um, by this, I'd like to thank you for the attention. Uh, if there are questions, please contact me, please ask me. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I am, thank you so much for asking me to do this. Um, so I, like the other two speakers, I'm an interventional cardiologist in Dublin. Uh, I've been involved in lifestyle medicine for the best part of about five years and unfortunately I'm the only consultant in Ireland who is a certified lifestyle medicine physician. Uh, there are a number of primary care doctors who do something similar um, and so the process as was mentioned in the earlier talks this morning is all about persistence. Uh, I wanted to be a little bit different and give the context in cardiology uh, related to COVID uh, as it's arisen in Ireland over the last 12 months and how it's affected our delivery of cardiology services uh, because it throws up a lot of issues that relate to how uh, lifestyle medicine is going to have to be reframed a little bit and where we're going to have to prioritize um, our treatment. So if I can have the next slide. So um, for those of you who know where I come from, the population is relatively small. It's uh, about five million people. Um, and so we, in some respects, have been fortunate that we've only had uh, 2,015 deaths so far from coronavirus, um, which is a case fatality rate of about 2.5%. There's a slight edge of women in Ireland having had coronavirus itself over men. Um, and the mean age is quite young, although the spread of the age range is also quite high. Um, and about 15% of our coronavirus cases are happening in people over 65. Um, the locations, so Dublin is obviously the biggest county in Ireland, has the largest proportion of population, uh, and that has the highest incidence of, of coronavirus, but, and has consistently done that. But also, interestingly, some of the counties that are very close to Northern Ireland have high rates as well. So one county, which is called Donegal, there's a very high incidence of coronavirus because most of the people who live there commute into Northern Ireland to work every day. Uh, there is another county which has an equally high rate because they recently won a football championship and virtually everybody in the county decided to celebrate that occasion and they managed to spread coronavirus around half the county. Um, but that, uh, that's a, an outlier more than any other county. So most of the transmission has been local or community-based. Um, and patients who, or people who tend to be over 55, get a much higher rate of hospital admissions. Um, and a much higher rate of ICU admissions is seen in patients who are over 55 and up to about 75 years of age. So the other factors that we've observed is a very high rate of infection in healthcare workers, primarily amongst nurses, primarily female nurses, and also healthcare attendings, who tend to bring it in from nursing homes where we've had a particularly high rate, the same as most other parts of the world. And a lot of our nurses have not actually been getting coronavirus in the hospital, although it's very difficult to detect whether they didn't pick it up in the hospital and present with their symptoms at home. Um, the thing that's relevant to lifestyle medicine um, is that 25% of cases in Ireland have been in people who had an underlying medical condition, which is relatively small, I think, compared to a lot of the rest of the world. Of those people with a medical condition, 50% only have one chronic medical condition um, and a smaller number get two, three and, and so on. So the vast majority of patients have either COPD, hypertension, some degree of chronic heart disease, diabetes or chronic neurological conditions, a lot of which would include dementia. 
Um, and amongst the people who are dying from coronavirus in Ireland, 43% of those who died have died uh, in the setting of having known heart disease. There is a very small proportion of patients who are morbidly obese, but there are a very small proportion of Irish people who are morbidly obese. There'll be a higher number of people whose uh, BMI range would be between 30 and 40, so they'd be overweight. Um, and also the sicker patients, uh, by virtue of population, are the ones who tend to do worse, uh, which is the same everywhere else. So can I have the next slide, please? So the implications in relation to lifestyle medicine for what's going on at the moment in our country is clearly um, multifactorial, um, similar to other countries, and that is, so our physical health issues related to chronic diseases clearly create an issue about whether our lifestyle medicine interventions, uh, how they're going to be um, undertaken, adapted, uh, a greater focus needed around prevention and management of those conditions to stop them happening. There's also interesting issues that have arisen because of the emergent nature of the, the, the situation, and that is that our health system, like Romania, is very deficient in, in, in vital areas. Um, and they were always there before COVID came to, to this country and have really exposed the weaknesses of the health system to an even greater degree uh, than one could possibly imagine. Um, some of that's due to the fact that the nature of the pandemic was so acute that the health system is not equipped to deal with that sort of crisis. Um, some of it's to do with the absence of preventive health care in the country as a strategy. And some of it's to do with the way the health system itself is actually managed at a governmental level. Um, the other issue is that as a consequence of COVID, the government uh, decided to lock down Irish society from the months of March to June. It had the most incredible impact on hospital waiting lists. Everybody stayed at home and nobody went near a hospital. Everybody was petrified. If they did, they'd get COVID. So all the heart attacks, all the strokes that you would normally see from day to day, month to month, stayed at home. And so we started to see patients with acute heart attacks who presented two weeks, three weeks later with Q waves on their ECG, suggesting they've had them for a long time, new onset of patients with heart failure at a relatively young age, and people who'd had strokes who had ignored them and then subsequently come into hospital at a later stage when they felt it was safer to actually come near a hospital. Part of the problem there was that the hospitals um, were all seeing COVID patients that weren't dedicated sites. And part of the problem was I work in the private health system. Because the government got very scared of what was going on in Italy, they decided to take over the private health system in Ireland and nationalize it. So the two and a half million Irish people who have private health insurance ended up on the back of the list of the two and a half million people who have no health insurance. And therefore there was no um, allowance made to deal with that group of people and their chronic diseases. Next slide, please. So, as a consequence of what's been going on for the best part of nine months, we now find that the needs around lifestyle medicine are increasing exponentially. We also have newer situations. Those patients who have picked up COVID and have developed long COVID illnesses primarily are much younger. They have lots of symptoms, many of which are this overwhelming exhaustion that they can't do anything uh, in people who are usually perfectly well. And we seem to have very limited treatment options. One of the anecdotal things here is that I have been treating a number of doctors with long COVID illness um, who they themselves have gone into the medical literature to explore treatment options, most of which have been alternative medicine as opposed to conventional medicine. And we've also managed to hook up with some other practitioners basically in the UK who've done a lot of rehabilitation, exercise retraining medicine as a way to try and manage some of these people. So some of that's been very effective, but it's been very interesting to get the insight of fellow professionals in terms of how they'd like to be treated for a condition that was newly diagnosed, does not appear to have any treatment. And a lot of them are very curious now about lifestyle medicine purely as a consequence of this particular uh, complication with, with coronavirus. One of the other things, which I'm sure is the same everywhere else, is that because of the consequence of people being locked down or the pubs being closed or people working from home where they didn't before, is that the vast majority of people have become more inactive they're eating much more food than they did before, they're consuming more alcohol, the sleep patterns are off, and the stress levels have reached an epidemic proportion, as I'm sure is the case everywhere else. And so unfortunately, that means that uh, that will have a huge challenge on new cro chronic diseases uh, over the next five to 10 years. And as well as that, it means that with a prolonged period of time of these new habits, it's very, very difficult to get people to change their habits when they've been at it for nine or 10 months. 
Um, so, and as I said as well, the mental health issues with the whole pandemic have been colossal as well. Um, most of it seems to be driven by a lack of uh, uns a lack of certainty as to what's going to happen, whether future treatments will work. But also, a lot of people are isolated here in Ireland. The older population have been told to cocoon, stay away from contacting with other people. The older population are not able to meet their friends, their families, um, and and so the whole impact of social isolation has become a, a, a significant issue uh, in this context and its contribution to long-term health. Next, please. So, as I mentioned, mental health, not just in the elderly, one of the big challenges with the health system here is that we have a huge shortage of psychiatrists and community uh, chronic disease management uh, services. And so in mental health, the anticipation is we will have a huge epidemic of that as an issue, and that will contribute to uh, stress and health-related conditions such as heart disease, uh, strokes, cancer, etc. We also have observed that there's significant social factors, again, within lifestyle, and that is we have a housing issue where lots of people share and live in the same houses. The typical example of this has become apparent where we got a huge outbreak of COVID amongst people working in meat factories, a significant amount of COVID in healthcare assistants and nurses, and discovered that the husbands were working in meatpacking factories and the wives were working in hospitals. And so they had a, a very natural way of spreading the condition amongst themselves, but also amongst a lot of other people. Um, so there has been other issues within the health system is low numbers of staffing, uh, limited resources, just like there are in Romania. And we have a new issue where the government have just let us, they've had a second wave of COVID. The situation is improving. They announced yesterday that they will open the country back up again for Christmas. Um, and we have a public health body that don't want them to do that. And we have an economic argument with the government who wants to do it. And so the whole question about who values health and who it's important to has become a very interesting uh, challenge going forward, which will again will create the challenge that we all have, how you get governments to advocate behind lifestyle medicine in the first place. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just to, in terms of cardiology it, it here, um, one of the other situations with COVID is because it took all the bed space out of our hospitals, a lot of the patients had stayed away. Uh, but we did still provide services like primary angioplasty and treatment for acute emergencies. Um, it was just that everybody else ends up in a waiting list to be seen in a hospital. And also the primary care doctors are extremely busy looking after patients, that access to them is also limited. So lots of patients were literally making their own decisions. What's also happened with coronavirus, a lot of the outpatient services have been delayed because of decisions made about more acute care that needs to be managed. And as a consequence of all of that, we now see a massive increase in care requirements uh, in, the last, in the latter number of months. And the biggest risk of that, that comes back again into lifestyle medicine issues, is that the stress level that's landed on the doctors and the nurses, a number of nurses and healthcare assistants who end up getting COVID go on contact tracing where they're off work for two weeks. And so we're losing a lot of staff in that way. And the pressure on those people working in the system is enormous. And that of itself will contribute to a huge health risk to the staff. So there is a huge need to do stuff with the healthcare profession ourselves in terms of lifestyle medicine. But the good thing, and a little bit like what Stefan shared is, we have as a profession come together. We have as a profession managed to, manage to look after patients and very sick patients. We've managed to keep the numbers down. Technology has had a huge play in terms of telehealth to deliver care to patients by primary care so the patients can stay at home. And also we've had a lot of new innovations, particularly in remote patient monitoring that have emerged within the health system. And the health system has been very supportive of local innovative uh, telehealth and telemedicine projects, allowing them to come directly into care at a much lower uh, level of, of standard than before, which has been a very positive thing. Next slide. So just in terms of lifestyle medicine, where we position ourselves, at least in Ireland, um, clearly I would suspect that lifestyle medicine moved to a much higher level. Um, a lot of people have talked about what the definition is. I think it includes everything. And I think there is a number of opportunities that, that lie uh, ahead of us. I would clearly say that there is a lack of insight as to what lifestyle medicine is, is in our small country. A lot of people know about all the things we should be doing. Uh, there's a big gap between knowing and actually doing. Um, I think that there's still a huge need for all of us as, as, as doctors to, to advocate for prevention, treatment, cure of disease, and risk factor management. I think there's also in the setting of COVID, as we've learned, there is a huge need for honest collaboration across countries, both across Europe uh, and across the world and across with involvement in government 
to try and help us manage situations like this. As we all know, it's all the heart diseases, the cancer and the strokes that are the big problems in health. It's not the coronavirus. The coronavirus will go away. And yet the governments respond very emergently to coronavirus. And yet the question is how well will they respond to our other conditions that we have to treat. But I also think in situations like ELMO and other lifestyle medicine societies that there's a huge opportunity, given what we've been through, to share the learnings in terms of how we manage chronic diseases as a, through the organization or from country to country in terms of trying to deliver better care uh, for our patients. And I think that the example of what COVID has done is a good model in some respects of how not to do things, but how to do other things. And so there's an opportunity to try and work around chronic diseases uh, by, by virtue of some of those learnings. I also think it's very important that we do something to support the profession. I have spent a lot of time giving um, habits coaching to frontline healthcare workers across the world to try and help them uh, manage their own stress levels uh, during this crisis. And I think we are gonna have a major problem in helping our colleagues and our nursing colleagues uh, to recover from the stress that they've been through in dealing with patients and also to help them manage resilience. And I think that's an area where lifestyle medicine has a huge factor to contribute in all its aspects. Um, and I think that's also the case to work across all sectors of the world and all sectors of the population, social backgrounds, ethnic origins, because it's also very clear that the coronavirus problem is much worse where you come from a poorer part of the world, where you're less educated, where housing is poor. And so there's multiple issues, as somebody said, around social medicine as part of lifestyle medicine. I have my next slide. So just to finish and, and give you a little update in terms of uh, where we are in Ireland, um, really what we're trying to do is get more people involved. There's a number of GPs who've done different exams in lifestyle medicine to make themselves uh, accredited, um, but we're really a small number. Now, I've been working a lot uh, to try and do different areas of interest from my cardiology practice. The reality is I've seen enough more patients with long COVID illness, which is of interest, uh, and definitely something worth exploring because I suspect the number of those patients is gonna be significant. I think there's a lot to be done around stress uh, and resilience management. I think there's a lot that's gonna to have to be looked at in terms of uh, physician self-care, nurse self-care and burnout and the contribution again of lifestyle medicine. And I also think as others have mentioned in terms of the definition of lifestyle medicine, it's much broader. But I think one of the things about it being broader is the idea that you involve lots of stakeholders. So instead of being just the doctors and the nurses and the government, uh, there's lots of stakeholders when it comes to housing, when it comes to uh, financial challenges, when it comes to spiritual challenges, that the wider group of stakeholders might be very valuable all to be in the same conversation uh, in terms of driving uh, lifestyle medicine forward. And by the same way, I think it's an opportunity just like coronavirus where health is now all of a sudden the most important thing to people in their mind after what has happened, that there is an opportunity to cooperate around the world across all the societies in terms of the importance, particularly of lifestyle medicine and preventative health, knowing that they're all the people who suffer the most uh, so far from, from the illness. I think I have one more slide. So as somebody said earlier on about persistence, small steps going forward, that's where lifestyle medicine is here at the moment. As I said, there's myself and David are both uh, the ambassador and the clinical representative for ELMO. Um, and we are both trying different ways to try and drive and advocate for lifestyle medicine here. Uh, I mentioned that there's a very small number of people who are actually certified as lifestyle medicine physicians or primary care doctors. That is important so that people here realize you're getting treated by a doctor or a suitably qualified person as opposed to a doctor who thinks that they cover all aspects of lifestyle medicine because patients get distracted by social media. They see people giving them nutrition advice and think that's where they should go. And ultimately that information is not necessarily, uh, that's more populist based information than medical based information. I also work very closely academically with one of the medical schools, which is the University of the Royal College of Surgeons. I have been involved with trying to create a teaching program there. So they have been following the ACLM module with Beth Freites, who has been here to talk to the, uh, the college. And so we have set up a parallel program for our undergraduate medical students, which is due to launch later of uh, 2021. We are also putting lifestyle medicine on the undergraduate program with the idea that hopefully that the graduating class of medical school in five years time will actually practice lifestyle medicine unlike the current group of physicians who have a different way of doing it. Um, interestingly, the gym in the medical school announced this week that the gym instructors were going to educate uh, students in lifestyle medicine as part of trying to get them to exercise. So it's good to see that there are different facets of the college trying to do things. 
and I'm involved with the graduate diploma programs in coaching and lifestyle medicine through positive psychology to try and educate people around what lifestyle medicine is and to educate people around behavior management and, and behavior change, uh, which is something I've evolved an interest in over the last number of months. Um, the government do try since COVID to in endorse people to be healthier. They're well aware there's a mental health problem. They're well aware of the need for activity. They're well aware of the consequences of isolation. They say a lot, they don't do a lot, uh, which is a little bit unfortunate because we can educate everybody with information, but the reality is people need to be doing things uh, when it comes to lifestyle medicine. And I think that uh, certainly there will be plenty of work. There'll be a huge amount of work here in terms of all the areas that I've mentioned, which coronavirus I think has helped actually to, to bring to the surface, uh, whereas before they might have just been moving along very, very slowly and just left in the background. So. Uh, my hope is that we will continue to advocate for lifestyle medicine. My hope is that we will continue with the academic involvement to grow it. We will get some attention from the government in terms of supporting it, uh, and we get more people involved. And my real hope is that the likes of Elmo and other societies that we do work with, and different groups here, including the sports medicine faculty that I work with, to try and make lifestyle medicine much more at the forefront than it actually is. So uh, thank you all very much, and thank you, Jan, for asking me to, to, take, uh, to be involved in this. Um, I didn't speak too much about cardiology, but I felt that others would probably contribute the same. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the focus being around coronavirus for a change. Uh, no, thank you. I mean, what you presented, it's a really a big work. And uh, look what can, can do a cardiologist uh, <laughs> next to, uh, to the everyday practice where you really have a huge responsibility. And just an example about saying how many people are involved in lifestyle medicine. It was just funny that we had uh, uh, someone who just uh, followed the European certificate and uh, he's just, he just came to start to work in the hospital where you work. So it was just, oh, great, let's, let's connect. So I hope that will be someone who will uh, help to develop lifestyle medicine yeah. in Ireland. So thank you. Okay, uh, Johan, how do we uh, uh, proceed this session? How many minutes do we have left? Uh, we, it's a good 10 minutes because, okay, we've been, uh, we've been a bit late. So please, if you, I, I will look for questions, if there are questions, or I don't know if you saw some questions. So then, uh, yes, what I can propose to the panel is I, I came across one uh, question, interesting question that the, somebody is saying that the, the COVID crisis um, is uh, expressing the need to uh, reinvent medicine, how we uh, practice it today. And I must agree with that. And with regard to COVID, especially when I talk of my country, uh, there has been a lot of attention in the media about talking about uh, quarantine measures, but almost nothing on the importance of being uh, physically active, of, of taking care of, of what we eat uh, in the media. There has been almost no coverage here. So it's really astonishing, I must say. Carlos, I, I, I make a comment. Um, one of the things about the social media, you're right, is that there's been a lot of messaging around all the bad things uh, and all the negativity and all the doom and gloom, which is really not good for, for long-term health. Uh, whereas I think that's where opportunities like Elmo and others have to really push a message out there of positivity and a message out there of all the little, all the different lifestyle measures that drive good health, prevent uh, another crisis like COVID, uh, kind of taking out people who, if they were healthier, would actually be able to, to survive. Uh, and again, I think that's, there is that kind of opportunity, that strange opportunity that arises here uh, to drive home, home something that's really, really positive and worthwhile. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, other comments, uh, Stefan, uh, Isaveta, how about... Uh... Oh, I, fully, I fully support what you said, Carlos. This was the same uh, situation in, uh, in Romania. No one speaks about uh, doing a uh, healthy uh, um, lifestyle, uh, in implementing healthy measures uh, in the life of the citizen in order to be healthy. Uh, this is why we initiated this action within the University of Medicine just to try to tackle a part of the things of stay away 1.5 meters from the other person to try to implement also some uh, some guidance, some, some general issues related to eat healthy, do continue to do physical activity or start doing physical activity and all these issues because I, I, I see that the situation is the same all around the world and basically it's also what Robert said, 
this is the, the need from us, I presume, because I don't know exactly why the ministries don't see this issue as important as taking 1.5 meters distance from one of each other. I can reply to that. They don't take advantage of the, the knowledge that is uh, present in our current organization. So I think we should be much more involved in, in tackling this, uh, this issue. It's, uh, for example, uh, all the swimming pools in Belgium have been closed the last couple of weeks. I'm a competitive swimmer. Uh, I don't see the, uh, the need to close swimming pools, for example, or I mean, Can I, can I add something? Yes, of course. Hello, hello, everyone. Yeah, I think this all makes sense or doesn't, well, doesn't make any sense what's going on currently. And I think governments are also confused. It's time when you can be criticized for something that you have not done or for something that you have done. And many decisions are taken pre prematurely. And perhaps this is a momentum that we as the advocates for lifestyle medicine can use and utilize to come up with the strong message on lifestyle and how we can use lifestyle to confront the, the future challenges which are COVID related or as well are unknown. I think that the future is a little bit um, unknown right now for the medicine and how medicine will develop. Will it be very heavily influenced by governments and by decision of the people who don't really understand many issues in epidemiology and infection diseases, etc. So I think that's a momentum for us that we could use. Thank you. Uh, but if I may say, um, uh, what we forget, uh, forgot and we didn't uh, mention uh, much maybe today, um, that's actually why we are doing this. I mean, why we, we want to promote lifestyle medicine, why we want to offer consultation health services differently. Um, it's because the patients ask this. So today, if someone is coming to you and it's telling, and you are saying, okay, you should eat healthy. The next question will be, what? What should I eat healthy? You should do physical activity. What exactly? So you like a health professional, health provider, you are obliged somewhere to get more uh, training related to some of the chapters, what we today uh, we call uh, in lifestyle medicine. So- yeah. This pressure, I mean, the patient of today, it's not the same like five or 10 years ago. This is one thing. The second, look at the, the younger generation, 16, 20, 25. They have, I mean, they, they fight for climate. They uh, really look for what they eat, uh, local, bio, and so on. And these are, these are some pressures that we have to, I mean, we have to adapt if we want to be um, updated with the, the today's society. So I think this is where a big part of help will come uh, in promoting uh, lifestyle medicine. I, if I may, Johan, you have a very optimistic view because I would say that what I see, I see patients at 27, 28 years that can come into the cath lab with myocardial infarction, they smoke, they drink, they take energizers. So basically it's another picture that uh, at the time seeing and uh, uh, Yes, I have to, to say that, okay, my patients who are coming to lose weight, they are 25 or 30 years old and with some uh, cardiovascular complication indeed, but they are there. So, I mean, they come because they, they want or because they, uh, they have the chance that we saw today that some people who got some, 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 uh, some disease, some medical condition, and they had enough intelligence and enough inspiration to change their lifestyle. If this is the price to change your lifestyle, that they have to show up at 27 years old in your, uh, in your medical office, okay, this is the price, but definitely we'll, uh, we will give a, a longer, they will live a longer life, hopefully, uh, after the consultation by you. But they also um, need support. I think it's not only personal change, but it's all the environment. And I think it's it's absolutely multi multifactorable and needs multi stakeholder involvement. Yes.
you cannot yeah. advocate for, for uh, breastfeeding up to one year or two years and then mother has to go and work after four months of giving birth. So. Well, I uh, think uh, we have a question on the chat. I saw that it was to all of us. Uh, if we can provide an answer to this, uh, in fact, there were two questions. The first one was, what's on your opinion the best subspecialty to choose for someone interested in lifestyle medicine? Uh, to all cardiologists and uh, uh, from Romania I would say that we don't have something related to uh, to prevention in the sp subspecialties of cardiology. I am striving at the moment to, to create a, a, a sports cardiology and cardiac rehabilitation competency additional to after finishing the, the residency. We hope that we'll manage next uh, next year. And uh, I would like to take the chance to answer to the second question because I think also mm -hmm. Robert has the same uh, uh, the same uh, uh, point of view. And how can an interventional cardiologist and rehab cardiologist can combine his strong interest for lifestyle medicine? And I would say that in my opinion, this uh, interventional cardiology and cardiac rehabilitation is like you complete a chain because eventually, if when the patient comes into the cath lab and it has a an angioplasty, basically, the normality would be to direct him directly to cardiac rehabilitation in order to reinforce all these principles that I see also in uh, in lifestyle medicine. And the, unfortunately, the situation in Romania is that most of the uh, interventional cardiologists, after treating the patient, send them home and waiting for them to come back over again. Um, I would say that as an interventional cardiologist, uh, when you see lots of patients, uh, you can put lots of stents in, the patients still come back and let you do something about their risk factors. Uh, some will take tablets, a lot don't want to. Uh, and if you don't stop and get encouraged or finding ways to help them stop smoking and deal with all those issues, uh, they will continue to run into trouble, some will die. Uh, and I think as a cardiologist, that's, uh, you can't afford not to do that. Uh, in Ireland, we don't have enough cardiologists to be able to see the interventionist and go and find another cardiologist to look after preventive cardiology or somebody else. One of the interesting consequences of COVID is all our cardiac rehab programs are closed because they're done as groups, and so they won't put large groups of patients together, uh, and that is something that's not going to be resolved immediately. So, uh, you know, everybody has to try and contribute and help. In terms of the specialty of medicine or surgery, Every specialty of medicine and surgery is valuable for lifestyle medicine. If you want to be a surgeon, you can still educate your patients in terms of aspects of lifestyle medicine, in terms of their surgical outcomes. If you want to be a dermatologist, a primary care doctor, an obstetrician, whatever you want to be, uh, you can contribute lifestyle medicine because that's invaluable in terms of all health. So uh, pick what you want to in terms of your medical or surgical specialty. If you want to be a pure lifestyle medicine physician, pick that. I would, I would just add because there are also uh, some questions re uh, referring to the multidisciplinarity, the network, and was a question related to the pharmacy, what, the pharmacist, what is the role there? And it's true that uh, <clears throat> unfortunately today we could not organize, we have also pharmacists, but uh, regu I mean, regularly we have a pharmacist who uh, start uh, initiatives. So going in the pharmacy, you don't get just the, the medication, you start to get also um, uh, lifestyle, healthy lifestyle advices. I think it's, it's an, an amazing initiative. So all the uh, health, the, the contact points with health, uh, they promote this. So I think it's, 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 it's amazing like idea if you can organize in your pharmacy these special uh, corners of lifestyle uh, advices. Well, Matthias, well, especially people on medication need uh, as a complementary lifestyle um, intervention. Uh, you on? Yes, please. Uh, did you uh, receive my latest presentation I sent you 30 minutes ago? Maybe to close this session, I would like just to show one slide that asks a lot of sure. uh, responds to a lot of questions, I would say. Okay. That is the last one. So you have to, you have to go to the end of the presentation. No, that's not the most recent presentation. 
Um, okay, so uh, I use the last one. So just I will I will look for it. Um, I think until I'm looking, if there are some questions, so then I can uh, I can look for the. Um, the last one is this one. One of the questions is, can you conduct a stress test to estimate cardiorespiratory fitness using artificial intelligence and telemedicine methods? I can reply to that. Uh, for me, the cardiorespiratory fitness and determine the VO2 max is one of the most important tests to determine your uh, general health and your longevity. So for me, in my uh, cardiology practice and lifestyle management practice, it's one of the most important tests. To connect it with artificial intelligence, I don't have uh, experience with that and telemedicine methods, but yeah, maybe in future it's something um, uh, we could work on. I would say that taking into consideration that we have a lot of portable devices that have been developed in terms of CPAP functionalities, it's not too close to be possible to do it by telemedicine. Mm -hmm. um, just one second. Yeah. Uh, there are still some questions until I open it, if you want. At the moment, there are no other questions. Uh, not in the chat, they are in the chat and in the questions. So there are two. Uh, the... Okay, there is one question to, uh, for Robert. So related to the uh, uh, Ireland situation, and you don't have too many cardiologists in the country, what will be your advice to colleagues and patients? Should people trust the upcoming vaccination campaign? So I get asked this question every single day of the week um, by different groups of patients. It creates a huge amount of ethical challenges, um, including if you're very elderly, where most people have died from COVID, uh, should you be vaccinated? Including if you are a young nursing mother uh, who may be a school teacher and often a nurse, you're a frontline health worker, you're in front of young children, should you be vaccinated? Do you want to take the chances? And I'd say to all of them, first of all, the paper isn't published yet on from any of the vaccines, so I have to wait. But I have said that I, as a physician, will take the vaccine on the basis that I am exposed to so many different patients and because I am a risk myself if I were to give it to any of them, which would affect the way I practice medicine. Um, do I trust the rest of the country in terms of the vaccine? The vaccine trials were all done outside of Ireland. So uh, this is the slide, uh, Johan. So uh, this is um, uh, a nice overview which I came across a few years ago, which uh, to me uh, is a new paradigm in medicine and in health in general. And what you see here, there are two main components. You see the stages of health and disease, which is ranked from A to D. A means optimal health. D means uh, the presence of uh, often advanced disease. And then you have at the top the levels of intervention and the levels of intervention it's at different uh, levels and different stakeholders are involved it's the uh, uh, government it's the local community it's the uh, healthcare providers doctors and uh, non-medical doctors we have to uh, work together in order to be able to uh, keep the people as long as possible in the optimal health status, which is status A. And how do we do that? It's guided by four principles. Uh, be predictive. So what I mean by that is uh, if you see high cholesterol level or the appearance of hypertension, it's a, a early sign that you move to an unhealthy uh, status. So uh, work early on uh, uh, early disease markers. Be personalized. Um, 
not everybody, not every patient is the same. For example, we prescribe uh, too much uh, of statin therapy to people who, in fact, don't need statin therapy. But when you do uh, cardiac CT scans, you often see uh, you don't see any disease in people who, for a long time, take statins. For example, and the other important thing is uh, be patients who come to see us need to be participatory. That's uh, contrary to the uh, current healthcare model, which is reactive and in which the doctor, in fact, decides what is necessary. The uh, new concept is to be proactive and uh, have the patients involved in their healthcare trajectory. So I think this is uh, a nice overview to, uh, to close this session. And I think uh, it's uh, useful um, uh, to start working with for all healthcare professionals.